All right. So earlier we were talking about Rust in 2017 and everything, and that's kind of what I do during the day, but this is what I do for fun. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Rayon, which is this library that I've been hacking on on and off for a while. Um, the idea of Rayon is I want to make it easy for you to add parallelism into your code. And specifically, I want to make it really easy for you to take kind of for loops or iterators that you were doing and make them run in parallel. Right? So some function that took too long should take less time. Uh, and people often call that data parallelism. And so if you look at this piece of code, right, this is a sequential loop using iterators to load a bunch of images off the disk. Right? So probably many people here are familiar with iterators, but the basic idea is right, you have a start with, in this case, a slice, so like an array of paths, and we're going to create an iterator. And that's a little thing that it doesn't actually do anything yet. It lets me build up something that describes what to do when I actually do the loop. Right? So initially, I have just this blanket iterator that would just be saying, OK, go up and give me one path. Give me each path as I go through. And then I'm going to call map. And what that says is kind of, for each path, I'm going to invoke this function, which is going to call image load. So I had paths. Now I'm going to have actually images loaded off the disk. But I still haven't done anything yet. I'm still just building an iterator describing what I will do. They're kind of lazy like that. right? And here, when I call collect, that's when the actual iteration happens. So it starts to iterate through for each path, it's going to call image load, and we'll end up with uh, a set of images which we'll store into a vector. Right? And we figure out that we want a vector because that's the return type of this function. So what I'd like you to be able to do is say, well, loading an image is something that I could easily do in parallel, so why don't I just do that by changing dot iter to dot par iter. And ideally, that's all you have to do. And in fact, with Rayon, that is all you have to do, except you have to add one import that I didn't show, use Rayon prelude star. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? Uh, you can now load a full directory of images and it'll go a little bit faster. But there are a lot of languages actually that will let you do things like this. But one of the catches is you have to know that it's safe to do it in parallel, right? It's very easy to think something is safe to do in parallel, but actually maybe you'll get s different surprising results where your program doesn't work. So here's an example of something you, you might have done. You might have had a little counter and you were trying to track here you go, this is what I added, right? Uh, just trying to track how many ping files you had as you went through. So you have a counter and you add one to it as you go. That seems fine, that was fine in sequential code. But if you try to do this in parallel, it's not so good. And the problem is that you have what's called a data race. And really what happens is, kind of a, a simple way to think about it is that adding a number is a three-step operation, right? I have to load the first the number out of memory, add one to it, and then put it back. And if you have two threads doing that, they might both load up the number, and they both say, let's say, C0. They both add one. They both have one now, and they both store one. And we should have two, but we only have one as the total count. And what's kind of nasty about these bugs is that a lot of times they don't show up very consistently. Right? So it might work just fine on your computer. Uh, maybe you only have two cores or something, and they rarely conflict. But once in a while, or maybe you have a big directory full of images, and so the right count is 1,556, and your count is 1,442. And of course, you didn't actually count them by hand, so you don't know that it's wrong, and your program just keeps going. Right? But in Rust, if we use Rayon, what will happen is we just won't compile at all. Right? So the goal is kind of when you add this par iter, not only should it work in parallel and hopefully run faster if you have enough work to make it worthwhile, but in case there is actually a problem, it should let you know. Right? So it won't just go and do the wrong thing. And there was a fun blog post, uh, not written by me, that kind of went into this, where someone added in Rayon, and they got some errors. And when they traced it out, it turned out that there was basically this same bug I just showed you, where a counter was getting incremented. But it wasn't like in one function and easy to see. It was spread apart several modules, and it would have taken them forever to track it down. But it just didn't happen at all in the first place. So they were happy about that. And I was happy, because they wrote a cool blog post. Um, so this is the structure of Rayon. And it's also the structure of my talk. <laughs> uh, Rayon's kind of broken up into several layers. Right? There are these parallel iterators that I just showed you. And those are actually essentially all safe code. They're like a library written on top of a more fundamental abstraction. And that's called join. And join offers up a safe interface that lets you essentially start two threads, as we'll see. But internally, it's implemented with unsafe code. And it uses this uh, technique called work stealing we'll talk about. 
And that's based on this thread pool that's kind of the underlying bit of code. So I'm going to start talking about parallel iterators, so to show you how you can use them and some of the things to be aware of, then talk about join and how it works, and, uh, and talk a little bit about how the thread pool manages to do load balancing and stuff like that. So, okay. Sequential iterators, we saw, these are like normal iterators, right? The basic idea, the basic reason that sequential and parallel is not always the same is that sequential goes from left to right all the time, right? But in parallel, the whole point is we want to process in any order, and sometimes more than one at a time, right? And that means that some things that we used to do just don't make sense in that setting, right? So ideally, it would always be as simple as changing dot iter to, par, to dot par iter, but it's not always quite that simple. There are a few things that might lead to, uh, to surprises. And the first one we already saw, which is that you can't really mutate shared state um, in these two iterators because, as we saw, like when you try to both increment a counter, you might get confused. And another problem is that some of the iterator combinators actually just don't make sense in parallel at all, um, like fold, as we'll see. And so we have to do different combinators that work a little bit differently. And finally, this is a spare time project. A lot of times things would be just fine, but nobody got around to implementing them yet. So, you know, PR is welcome. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a work in progress, right? So let's come back to this first one about shared state. Right? This was my example I showed you before, where you have this counter, and I said it's bad because you're going to be uh, I I incrementing it in two different threads, and we don't want to do that. And you might infer from this that maybe you can't do any mutation at all when you're doing parallel iteration. And a lot of people, I think, equate these sort of things. They say, well, if I'm going to do parallel iteration, I really need, or parallel work, I really need a functional approach. I can't do any mutation and so on. That's not really true. It is helpful. But it is perfectly fine to mutate in parallel as long as you're muta mutating different things. Right? So here is an example where I have a function that has a mutable slice of integers, which it goes over. And this is still sequential, of course. And it's calling iter mute. So if you haven't used iterators too much, the difference between iter and iter mute is that iter mute gives you a mut mutable reference into the elements. So you can kind of change them as you iterate over them in place. Right? So here, this variable c is going to be basically first a reference to the first thing in the slice, then the second one, then the third one, and so on. And so for each one, we're going to increment it. So effectively, when we give this as input a slice that has like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we'll get output 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? everything up by 1. And we can do this in parallel. It's no problem. It looks a little bit different, but not too much. Of course, we do par iter mute to go into the parallel mode. And then we have to do this dot for each. That's because for in, in Rust is like the sequential syntax that's kind of built into the language. So we use for each instead so that I can actually run it in parallel. But essentially, it's the same idea, right? We're going to call this closure for all the things in parallel. And it has a reference C pointing into the array, and it can increment. So this is exactly equivalent, right? And the key point is the data was not shared between the iterations, the data we were going to mutate. So sometimes that will be because we've used something like par iter mute that's kind of subdividing an array into lots of disjoint mutable pieces, each one separate. And sometimes it might be because you've just got a mutable, uh, well, not so much with parallel iterators, but more if you were using join, which lets you start two threads. You might have some mutable data that goes to one thread and other mutable data that goes to the other, and that's perfectly fine, as long as the same mutable data doesn't try to go to both. Right? So, okay, that's good. But how could I... I still want to count all the pings in my directory, right? I don't, uh, and how can I actually do that? There are a couple ways you could do it. One way might be you might split this loop up. Instead of doing everything in one walk over the list of paths, you might do two. So here you would uh, have this first pass where you iterate over the paths, and we filter out. So we just select only the paths that end in ping. And then we call dot map to convert each one of those to the number one, and then we add up all the numbers ones. Uh, you could also call dot count, except that I hadn't implemented it when I made these slides. But I recently opened a PR this morning, because I was like, this is ridiculous. We should have dot count. Um, <laughs> so in a few days, maybe you can. Uh, so that would be one way to do it. And there is actually another way, right? And the, this way is a little bit sneakier, and I actually don't probably recommend you do it this way. But it is interesting to know about. 
the standard library offers these cool types called atomic types. Um, and they're, they're hidden deep in this foreboding path hierarchy. Uh, what they let you do is actually have mutable state that is shared between threads. Right? And so in this case, we'll be using something called atomic u size. Right? And we can make it like this. So let pings equals atomic u size nu zero. And now pings is going to be also still an integer, but it's one that we can only access through the atomic u size API. And the atomic u size API is kind of special because when I told you that normally when you increment things, it's a three step process where you read the value, add one, and write it back. Atomic use size makes sure that all of those steps are done without anybody else interrupting you. Right? So you can add two, uh, two, many threads can add to the counter safely without stepping on one another's toes. Right? So we can change this code. So instead of writing pings plus equals one, now I get to write pings that fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent. Uh, I, another thing I strongly recommend is that you at least start with the sequentially consistent ordering, especially if you don't know what, I'm, what that means. Uh, basically, that means things work like you expect them to. Um, <laughs> and so what this will do is this will, exactly like before, so bef when in the sequential code, pings was a counter that was kind of saying, how many pings had I seen so far, right? And when I, I, should, I, meant, when I go back to the old version here where I broke pings out into a separate loop, that was a little bit different, right? Because now pings wasn't a counter of how many I'd seen so far. It's a count of the total number. Um, so if we want to go back to how many we've seen so far, we can use atomic u size. And now again, pings is representing how many have I seen so far. But unlike in the sequential case, that's not an easy thing to think about. Right? Before it was, oh, it didn't, in the sequential case, it didn't change as we were going because it was just all the people to the left and they were waiting for me. But here there might be other people going at the same time. So every time I read pings, even in two lines right next to each other, I might get different values. Right? And that's why I suggest that that's why I say that you can do this if you want to have a counter that you're incrementing, but you know, use it at your own risk because it's very easy to forget that two lines right next to each other can get interrupted by other operations. Um, so another thing you could do is use a mutex of integer and so forth, but I think at that point it's over, overkill for this example, let's say. Um, in any case, the main thing is there are these atomics, so you can do writes if you really want to, but you have to be aware this is where if you don't use atomics, essentially your code should either compile and do pretty much the same thing or not compile for some reason. If you use atomics, it starts to be that it could compile but act in, in quite different ways because you've added a whole lot of threads into the system. Um, so that's, that's shared state. I also mentioned that some combinators just don't make sense in parallel. And here's an example of one. So this is a sequential loop, standard iterators. And it's doing this thing called a dot product, which you may remember from MathBus. I, I didn't, but <laughs> I like to use it anyway. Uh, I, like, I remember the name, right? So basically what a dot product does is it takes two big vectors of numbers that are the same length, and it walks over them in lockstep, right? So we might start with the three and the two from these two vectors. We multiply them together. That's what this map is. And that gives us a number, like here, six. That's the product of the two. And then we, we add up all those products. And we can do that add. We could call dot sum, but this is, what dot sum does is actually just call dot fold. So we can use this operation called fold. And what a fold does is it has like an accumulator and a thing that keeps getting accumulated in with this closure, an operation. So in this case, we'll be accumulating by adding. Right, so we start out with zero. That's the initial value of our accumulator. And then we take six and we add them together and that's our new accumulator. So the sum so far is six. And then we would go to the next item. Here we have two and one. We multiply them. We add it in. Our number changed to eight. And we can kind of keep doing this. And we'll eventually, if I typed it in my computer right, we'll get 82. Right? That's our dot product. And you can see that this, is, this fold operation is very sequential. It said, start with an accumulator. Take the next item. Put it in. Take the next item. Put it in. Um, it doesn't really make sense to, to parallelize it. So if you go in parallel, there is something that you can use to do parallel sums, but it works a little differently, and so I gave it a different name to kind of warn you. So this is another case of the code won't compile if it wouldn't do kind of the same thing. Um, so this thing is called reduce. And reduce kind of works like fold, except that instead of starting from the left and going to the right, it essentially breaks your, your list into little pieces, independent pieces. And Rayon will figure out kind of automatically how big these pieces should be, or try to, right? 
And it will do them all in parallel with one another. And within any individual piece, you're essentially doing a fold. Right? So we might start, we have now here three chunks, and we can compute three partial sums. We have 20 for the first four, and then 19 for the next four, and then 43 for the last three. And now that's good, and then we have to combine those partial sums to get the total sum over the whole thing. Right? So then we would add 20 and 19, and we get 39. And we add in 43, and we get 82. But you can see this worked a little bit differently. Not only did it not go from left to right, but one other more subtle difference was that this closure, the A plus B, in the fold case, the B value was always something coming out of the iterator, and the A was always the accumulator. So they could even have different types. They don't have to be the same sort of value. In the reduce case, the A plus B, the A and B can sometimes be things one is an accumulator and one is a thing you're iterating over. That's when you're computing that first row. But then after that, the A plus B, the A might be 20 and the B might be 19. Those are partial sums. They never appeared in our iterator, right? So the types have to be the same. And so that kind of shows up in the signature. So re essentially reduce probably most folds that you do in practice, reduce probably works just fine, but not all. And you have to be a little careful. And you particularly want, I think it's commutative operations, or maybe it's associative. Associative. The ones where you can change the parentheses. Right? I always get them mixed up. Uh, okay, so in summary, parallel iterators are basically mostly like normal iterators, but you can't mutate shared state, and you have to watch out for some operations that are just a little different. So another example is find, right? Find finds in a sequential iterator the first thing that matches some predicate. And in parallel, of course, you don't want to find the first thing, you want to find something because you're going to be searching all over. Um, or, I don't know, you might, it depends what you want. So the goal is that for the most part, Rust and the designer of Rayon will protect you from surprises by saying, if it compiles, it should kind of work uh, like you expect. And otherwise, we will try to do it. Uh, you may have to make some small changes. All right, so that's how parallel iterators work. And what I want to do now is take a step down and look at how they're actually implemented and how the thread pool works. So the core operation in Rayon is actually this thing called join. And what join does is it takes two closures and essentially potentially executes them in parallel, waits for those two threads to finish, and then returns back to you. Right? So the idea is that you should add join wherever parallelism might make sense, wherever it's possible to do safely, so where these things are not ac accessing shared mutable state, essentially. And then Rayon will decide when it thinks it actually will be profitable, when your code will actually go faster. Because right? if you think about it, you don't even know you, your code may run. You don't know how many cores are on that machine. You don't know if they're playing an MP3 in the background that's taking up one of the cores or not. It's hard for you to judge just how many threads do you want. So what Rayon tries to do is look dynamically using these schemes and figure out how many threads, when it makes sense to split work, and so on. So you might wonder, like, okay, that join makes sense and parallel iterators make sense, but how, do I, how would I ever get between them? They seem pretty different. Well, the way it works is basically something called divide and conquer, right, which is this common strategy we can use a lot. So basically, a parallel iterator starts out and says, I have a big pool of work to do. I have to go over all of these paths. So that's like my first job. And I also have this tool join. So what I'm going to do is make my work easier. I'm going to divide the list of paths into halves. And then I'm going to spawn with join two different threads, one to do the left half and one to do the right half. Okay. And so then when the left half thread starts up, it says, OK, well, I still have a lot. I still have six paths to go. I'm going to split these into two, one for three, one for three, and I'll use join to go like fork them off. And this kind of repeats, right? The right-hand side will do the same. We'll keep going until we have what seems to be a sufficiently small amount of work to do. Maybe it's one, maybe it's a little more. And then we'll actually execute the iterator just sequentially like normal. So here, this first job would actually call image load pads of zero effectively, and the second job would load image load pads of one. Right? And then this would filter back up. Now. I said that join doesn't always start new threads, right? So conceptually, I'm kind of starting new threads, and it's always safe to do so. But how is it really implemented at runtime? The idea is that we wind up having one thread roughly per CPU in your system. And those are the worker threads. And then we have those things, those things that go to join. Those are called tasks. And we're going to kind of multiplex them. We're going to have the worker threads share that pool of tasks that are available and do as much work as they can when they can. And we're using a technique called work stealing, which was, I think, pioneered and invented by the people who did Silk, but it was at least popularized by them. Um, Silk is a project out of MIT. 
the name rayon is because it's a fake silk, in case you were <laughs> curious. Uh, <laughs> and so what, how does that work? Well, it's basically like this. Every thread has a little list of work to do, which is called a double-ended queue. Here I just wrote queue. Um, so this thread might start out with a job, like process the whole array from 0 to 22. And so it's going to split that and call join. And what join does is it takes one of those closures and sticks it on this list of work to do later. That will be 15 to 22. And then it just starts right in on the, on the other one, just calls it like normal. So now 0 to 15 is executing. And this will again split. And we'll put one on the queue for later. And we'll do this 0 to 1. And maybe we'll finish that job, right? And then what do we do when we finish the job is we go back to our list of stuff to do later and we take the thing off the top, the most recent thing. So we'll go over here and start doing 1 to 15, right? And that's kind of thread A. But thread B is just sitting around twiddling its thumbs with nothing to do and threads don't like to be idle. So what thread B will do is say, I'm going to go look for work to do. And it goes, when it has nothing else to do, it goes and looks at other threads to see if they have any work on their list that they haven't started yet. And we call that work stealing. I, it's kind of a funny term because it's like a thief breaks into your house and says, look, this guy has a pile of, uh, <laughs> of dirty dishes. I'm going to start doing those. That'll be helpful. Um, so, you know, it's a nice thing. So thread B comes and steals 15 to 22 to help thread A out. And thread B then does basically the same thing. It splits it up into two jobs, puts one on its list of work to do later, and goes in, does it again, goes down the left side. And here it actually finishes a work item so it does exactly what thread uh, A did, pulls off the top thing on its queue and starts doing that. But meanwhile, while thread B is doing all that stuff, thread A is probably finished with the work it was doing. So it's going to come back and try to go to this next thing that was on its queue. Right? Only that got stolen. So that's not really left for us to do. So now thread A has nothing to do. So what does it do? Well, it goes and tries to steal back. So this is like I come home, I find the thief, and I say, oh, hey, give me that pot while you do the dishes. That's great. I'll take care of that one. <laughs> So we're all working together. Everybody's stealing back, back and forth from one another. And I take 18 to 22 off of thread B's queue, and, I, and thread A starts processing it. Right? And in this way, we kind of split up the pool. And whenever someone is idle, they go fill in and help somebody else out. Right? And the cool thing is, if some of these tasks may take more time than others, right? sometimes they're very uniform, like add one to every integer. That's going to take about the same time. But I don't know, loading an image, if the images are different sizes, Maybe one image takes a really long time and the rest are really fast. That's OK, because if thread A gets stuck doing one image, thread B can just keep stealing work and it's fine. Right? It'll kind of fill in. So that's the basic idea. Um, and there are ways to make it better. For example, there was a recent PR that I thought was really cool, so I wanted to highlight. This was Josh Stone or Viper's contribution that basically refines that idea by also being a little bit more cons by being careful about when to actually join. So it uses tricks like trying to gauge, is there likely to be anyone who's going to steal this work? Because if not, I won't bother to join, because that takes a little extra time. And so there are, there are new ways to make this better, and I'm sure it can get better still. Um, but that about sums it up. That's really most of the big ideas in Rayon, right? So essentially, we have the parallel iterators and the join. And together, using these, we can kind of easily add parallelism into our programs, sometimes just because it's cool, sometimes because it's actually running slowly. Um, and there's a bunch of different APIs available. So there's actually a third API I didn't have time to talk about called Scope that is sometimes it's kind of an alternative to join that is good for other situations. So it's kind of nice to read the library and figure out which is the best for your particular task. Um, and there's a lot of cool directions that we can take this. Um, of course, you can always have more iterators. But there's also, I, as I think, it should be possible to do things like automatically convert to SIMD ops. Uh, and integrate nice data structures like persistent trees and maybe factor out this thread pool into something that lots of projects could use, not just Rayon. So I'm excited to see where the future goes. Thanks, everybody.